A few people have asked me why hustling, why hustling for health, and uh, this term will come up a little bit later, but I just wanted to start, um, because hustling means a number of things in the dictionary. It can mean just being busy, being, doing something rather quickly. It's, the reason that I came across it first was because hustling is, refers to, or often refers to sex workers seeking trade, seeking business, and that's work that I've done in relation to uh, research on sex work. But hustling can also refer to, this is from The Hustler, the film, where hustling is actually conning people. And I think there's a number of people in the audience who've probably done inaugural speech. There's a num number of people who will do them in the future, who when they have to do an inaugural, will look at that sort of blank screen of slides and think, oh my God, why am I here? I'm going to be found out. <laughs> I've somehow managed to con everybody that I should be a professor, and actually I've got absolutely nothing to say. So, let's go and have a drink. <laughs> so, on that note, I shall move forward. So, when um, it also says in the advert for this that I'm going to try and say why there is a link between various parts of my research which cover such areas as sex work, the development of biobanks and large-scale research facilities, patient experience. And I might also add um, the specialties that I've been involved in, genital urinary medicine, first of all, then doing a lot of educational work and um, training in public health and now specialising really in interventional public health. Um, and trying to say what links this, one reason I have to try and answer this question is that when I had my interview for the chair, which is a nerve-wracking experience. I was asked by one particularly well, very nice person who actually knew me better than the other people on the panel and who said, well, this is very interesting, your career, all this stuff that you've done, fascinating and all that, but what exactly are you an expert in? <laughs> you've done research on sex workers, you've done behavioral work, you've done clinical epidemiology, You've also done molecular epidemiology. Um, you've done uh, sort of dabbled in anthropology and things like that. What, so what are you good, you know, what's your specialty? And I have to say that in, it's a difficult question. It was a good question. And my answer, which I hope to convince you, is that my specialty is public health. And that public health is a long definition, which goes on and on, but basically, it, this is the classic definition. It's the science and art of preventing disease, prolonging life, and promoting health. If you're going to be an expert in that, you've got to know a lot about a lot, is what I would say. So that there's not a single discipline that underpins public health. You do have to understand epidemiology. You have to understand the determinants of disease, the social determinants, as well as the biological determinants. And if you're going to make decisions, advice and so on, on public health matters, then I think you have to be, as I've put in the outline, a bit of a polymath. You do have to draw on different disciplines. Not double in them. I hope that I've not become a jack of all trades and master of all, jill of all trades and mistress of none, but that you actually understand more than just one discipline. So I'm going to have a drink of water, and then I'm going to talk about where, how on earth did I get here? Apart from on the Victoria line, which was delayed. <laughs> um, I was born in Manchester a very long time ago. And I'm, as my, uh, my husband said last night, I'm the last of the baby boom generation, the people that have had it all and made it, ruined the world for the rest of you. And so I was born in 1957, and so the NHS has been a big part of my life. In fact, I owe a lot to the NHS, um, including being born in an NHS hospital in the same ward that my father and his four siblings and my brother had all been born in. Things don't change up north. Um, I had a happy childhood. 
that's me. Um, and I think I'm crying there because I didn't want to be wearing a dress at a party. I wanted to be on my new bike that I got for my fifth birthday. And my first experience, which is to give you a little bit of background about me, which I think does draw together some of the experiences of my life and my work, is that I had some early contact with the NHS. The NHS had a child screening program, and I was discovered at the age of two to have a heart murmur. And so I had um, early clinical contact, which is one of the courses, I think, that our students do in their first year here now, but I was um, admitted to a hospital in Manchester, which I've subsequently found out was the first hospital to come into the NHS in 1948. I wasn't there in 1948. Um, now, this is what happened to me. Now, if I just look at this picture, it looks like a miners or something. These are surgeons performing the first open heart surgery for atrial septal defect in the 1950s. So this was before I had mine done, but I had an atrial septal defect, a hole in the heart, and was operated on um, with open heart surgery when I was uh, 14. No wonder they get infections. Look at the number of people <laughs> in that picture. And what I've, cl I've cut off the edge of that. There are actually people watching around. And I, I know that's what happened when I had mine done, because somebody told me afterwards, oh, there were dozens of people there watching your operation. We've never done one before. But how did, how did they do it? Well, this might be a little difficult to see, but this thing here is a bath. That bath was filled with water and ice to completely cool the body, the whole body, into deep hypothermia so that the heart could be stopped, so that they could do an operation because at a certain temperature, your heart can stop for 10 minutes and it won't do you brain any harm. <laughs> so they say. I don't know how they tested that out, but that was the theory. 10 minutes, you'd be all right, start off again. So that's what they did to me. So I've been dead for 10 minutes already. <laughs> I've only been going for seven. Um, so that's what happened to me. Now, I did survive. Um, I got better. And I think it did have an important impact on me in many ways, one of which was that it helped me make a decision about going into medicine. It was fascinating being perfectly fit and healthy, being put in this bath of water, being, you know, then for three months after the operation, really being incredibly debilitated and having to recover from this very serious operation. Um, but I really, under well, I got to understand what it was like being a patient and I was fascinated with the role of the medical teams that I was under. So I think it did affect my decision to go into medicine. So I went into Sheffield Medical School. Now I got into that and I thought this is going to be fascinating, this is going to be great, it's going to be, I was good at science and I thought this would be really stimulating. <coughs> Unfortunately I found it incredibly dull. Now, I know there's some medical students here. <laughs> and I know there's a lot of medical teachers here. And I'm sure it's a lot better now. <laughs> I'm sure it's wonderful now. But the first two years of medical school are, was just mind-numbingly boring. All you did was learn facts, or in my case, not learn facts, and therefore do rather badly. Um, however, living in Sheffield was great. <laughs> so this is what I did in Sheffield. Um, Sheffield is built on seven hills, very healthy. Everywhere you go is uphill. It's just bizarre. Um, Sheffield is a town of, or was then, a town of industry. Miners, of steel workers, of engineers. And the whole town, that's what really would characterize the whole town. So that, and as a student, you are often very isolated from that. But I, um, being bored with medicine, got very deeply involved in student politics and then in socialist politics, in students' union, in women's groups, and I got as involved as I could in the working class life in Sheffield. 
And that meant doing a lot of going on demonstrations, going on picket lines. And there's people here today who have been with me throughout all of those things. Unfortunately, although I learned an enormous amount about the world and about how normal people lived, and actually about health and what matters to people, I also didn't do very well. <laughs> but I got a real knack of failing exams and passing them with revision for the resets right through to my finals. <laughs> so I can't exact, I mean, if I'd been here, Jenny would have kicked me out of my ear before the second year. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. But I never really thought I'd end up being um, a professor, that's for sure, and I'm sure none of my, uh, none of my colleagues did either. So, but I did make it, and I became a junior doctor, and I went to, um, I did my house jobs in Doncaster. Doncaster is a small town outside, near Sheffield, um, and it was great experience, absolutely phenomenal experience, working in a district general hospital like that. Um, and then I moved to London, did accident emergency, and then eventually I came to St. Mary's. Now, I am very boring. I got a job at Prade Street, in the Prade Street um, Clinic in GU Medicine in, I think it was 1984. Yes, it was 1984. And basically, I've never left. <laughs> I still work in Prade Street. I've done a few things in between, but I've been there almost all the time. So... <laughs> I got the job, and what was interesting about the job, just the basics, um, house officer job that I did there, senior house officer and then research registrar, was that it really fitted with what I wanted to do. I was still interested in things outside medicine, so I wanted a, a job that didn't, you weren't on call every night and every weekend, and that was important to me. And I have to say, one of the only people who actually thought that it was reasonable for me to make that decision was John Weaver, who's sitting here because I talked to him about careers and said, well, I don't really want to do something that involves me working all hours. <laughs> How did that happen? I did that wrong, didn't I? I do work all hours. But anyway, at that time, I didn't want to work all hours, and he said, well, you know, go for it. Do what you feel is important. And it was really nice to have some encouragement to do that. So I did what was important, which was get a nine-to-five job. Except it wasn't really nine-to-five. It was incredibly busy those days in the, working in the clinic then and very good experience so what happened at that time was that it was just a walk-in clinic and I worked out a little while ago that I think I saw over 3,000 patients in the first six months I worked there we would see people for nine hours a day just continuously until the queues had gone um, but you learned an enormous amount now I'm going to move on this brings me into my foray into uh, sex work now Sex work, prostitution, as we re always referred to it then, is how I really got into the areas of area of research. Just trying to look around the audience. Some of you weren't around then, but for those of us who were around in the 1980s, it was a frightening time in terms of HIV and AIDS. There were only a few dozen cases in the early, well, in 1983. Um, um, and when I started at this clinic, I think there were about 100 cases known of AIDS. We had no test for it. We were just diagnosing people when they were very ill. And at that time, HIV was just being recognized and seemed to be the uh, causal agent. And there was this fear. Most of the cases were in men who had sex with men or in injecting drug users, some in haemophiliacs or people who'd had blood tr transfusions. But there was this fear that if you could put all those people into a kind of box that might say, not me, there was this fear that if it was just a sexually transmitted disease, then actually a huge proportion of the population might be at risk, especially if it affected prostitutes, because they might spread it around because notions of the transmission of STIs tended to think that it was core groups who spread disease and that those core groups were prostitutes. So the women were frightened. The general population were frightened that this might spread. So at that point in 1986, in fact, was when I started um, working on this particular area. The reason I got into this area, I think, was I, I 
decided that GU medicine was really interesting, I enjoyed it, and I wanted to pursue a career in that. And I got a research registrar post doing a drug trial. And Willie Harris, who was the head of the clinic then, obviously had decided that I would be a reasonable person to look after the sex workers when he was on holiday. He had a big private practice with sex workers. Um, and he would set, when he was on holiday, he would send them to the clinic and say, Who are the, what are the new doctors like? And a few of them had said I was all right. And so he said, well, okay, when this opportunity for setting up a special clinic, research clinic came up, um, Simon Barton did it initially, and then um, Willie asked me to take it over. I think I was nice to the sex workers, I suppose. Anyway, so I got involved in this research, and very early on, because I didn't know anything about research, I hadn't learned anything about research in Sheffield, um, I'd had tried to do a BSc, but they told me, oh, you don't want to do that, dear, you'll want to get married and have children, won't you? Um, so, and anyway, I wasn't a good student. So I didn't do a BSc, so I didn't know anything about research, really. Um, I was introduced then, early on, to Sophie Day, who's also here today. Now, Sophie had is an anthropologist and was just completing her PhD and wanted to also research the relationship between prostitution and AIDS. And so we met anthropologist, junior doctor. It was a bit strange, really. You know, I thought, what? who is this woman? What is she trying to do? And she probably thought, this woman knows nothing about research. What is she trying to do? But we actually came together to do this research together, and it's been a fruitful collaboration that has been going on to this date, at today. And um, Sophie, in fact, is now a visiting professor of anthropology in the School of Public Health and shares my office once again, or I share her office once again. So what did we do with this research? We were interested um, in the relationship between sex work and HIV. So what we did was we, well, there's various sources of data. First of all, we had to talk to sex workers, those that were coming to the clinic, find out whether or not they actually were at risk of HIV. Because people were making these suggestions without mostly politicians, newspapers, etc., even public health doctors, without knowing anything about prostitution. So we talked, did simple questionnaires, interviews, collected data on whether or not they had STIs, and also tested or offered testing for HIV. And that particular, what you might call a cross-sectional study, where we were following these women over time, carried on, and we've got baseline routine data right up to date, and I've got data here until 2009. But we also set up a cohort study to follow these women up, because at the beginning, risks may be different for over time. Then what um, Sophie was interested in, more anthropological approach to this, and therefore right from fairly early on, there was this strong qualitative component, whether interviews, repeated interviews, local field work, going out onto the streets, and um, mapping the local sex industry. There's a huge body of research here, so try and summarize. So I want to try and draw some of the more generic lessons and show how this led into later work. We started in a porter cabin under the clinic. So this here is the was the Prade Street Clinic. It's, there's now a Jeffreys wing which has moved up to another temporary building that will last forever. Um, and so if this is the, the clinic, which is kind of down at heel enough, well, it's, it's a ward now, it's the Victorian Albert Ward now, down at Heal Enough, really, then we, as the Prey Street Project, as our sex work project became known, was in a porter cabin under the clinic next to the HIV clinic. <laughs> and so if you wanted a kind of visual, ooh, you know, they're not even good enough to be in the STD clinic, which everybody thinks is awful, they're underneath it. Um, it was a, it sort of, represented quite a lot. Um, anyway, we were lucky to have that porter cabin, I tell you, space was tight then as it is now. Early outreach that we carried out meant that we went to local streets, the courts where women appeared after they'd been arrested, escort agencies, saunas. So this was a real way of getting to try and know the local population. 
And when I take that forward into public health that I've done subsequently and continue to do, that feeling of actually going outside of your comfort zone in a clinic, going outside the hospital, actually being where people are and understanding their lives, I think makes you a much better public health doctor. I think it also makes you a much better health professional anyway. So what do we find? Well, the most important thing is we publish quite a lot of papers because that's the, most, that's the only important thing for academics, really. But So I'll put a few up here. And they all sound the same, actually, but they're not all the same. They're all doing different things slightly. But what we found was that HIV was, there were one or two percent of the women. It was less than two percent throughout, and these women were actually at low risk of HIV. And those few who did have HIV, it wasn't directly associated with their work, with the high numbers of clients that they had. They were very keen. They were already good at safer sex in terms of using condoms and avoiding risk where they could. And that increased rapidly over the time that we were studying them. There were some continued risks of gonorrhea, for example, from boyfriends. But it seemed that in the actual commercial contacts, they were not at risk of being infected or infecting others. So the question we had started on, or not we, but had been posed at the beginning, would sex workers drive an epidemic of HIV in the general population? Then the answer appeared to be no. Well, not here in London in this particular group that we were seeing. So I think it was important. It's a fairly simple finding, but actually it raised quite a lot of issues that I think are important, one of which is... But as soon as we said that, people say, oh, well, that's just because that's the people you're seeing. The people you're seeing are not representative of everybody else. That may well have been true. We couldn't tell whether they were representative because there is no big list of prostitutes that you can take a random sample from. So we were doing everything we could to try and find the different groups and encourage them to take part in the research. So we had a, what we described as an inclusive sample. We try to include people. So this then gets rather woolly when it comes to epidemiology. However, if you dig deep into any epidemiological study, you will find a response rate that is, some are 20%. Biobanks, we'll come back to this later, but you know, biobanking tends to have quite low, the population ones, quite low response rates. In some areas, you can get 90%. But many of them will have a bias response rate. They won't be representative of all. But you can still learn from those samples if you understand those biases involved. So that's one of the things I think is important. The other thing is what, what you're interested in. Now, at this point, we're interested, or I was interested particularly in HIV and STI. I was, you know, I was doing genital urinary medicine at the sexual health clinic. That seemed to be the issue. Sex workers would be at risk of sexually transmitted infections. That's the issue. But actually, I think the other lesson is to have a much more open attitude to both what counts as health for these people, what's important, and what kind of services might actually be useful. What we observed, or what has been observed over the time, is that this, so this is the prevalence, this is the proportion of the sex workers when they first came to the clinic. Um, so this over. This is looking at three periods of time, 1985 to 92, 96 to 02, and then the most recent data that I've collated, 2008 to 9. And just this one line here, which is any STI. So when they first registered at the clinic and had a set of tests, screening tests, in the early years, 25% had one or more STIs, gonorrhea, chlamydia, trichomonas mainly. Um, and that went down to less than 10% and has stayed that. Um, gonorrhea was nearly 5% at the beginning and has gone down to almost none. So this was actually quite a dramatic change in the risks of these infections over time. And that was something that we wanted to explore how that, how that had happened, why that had happened. Because that happened 
over a time when there were major changes in the sex industry. And this is just, a, again, I'm just showing a few data slides. Again, in the broadly the 80s, the 90s, and the 2000s, this is showing where the women who used the project were from. So the green is those who were born in the UK. So it started off, it was 70 plus percent were born in the UK. Declined to most recently about 10% or less than 10%. So these were new recruits to the clinic and to the service. The blue is high income countries. Again, that has declined. And what you've seen the increase or the replacement, if you like, with women from low income and middle income countries. And these middle income countries were, many of them were from Central and Eastern Europe, um, but also from places like. Um, Brazil and so on. So this is a huge shift to have occurred in the makeup of the industry. So if in the 1980s it was a mainly UK population, they had been good at taking up these safer sex messages, they, were, they didn't want to take risks, this was work for them, they were very good at adopting condom use for example, but then how, was it, how did this get sustained while it was a change in population to become a completely different, really, makeup. And I think that's where I really learned of the value of doing combined methodologies, doing the quantitative work which just shows you, but doesn't really answer how or why. And so the qualitative work, um, I think, really helped with that. So the project itself, so the the health and safety was sustained despite these changes in the makeup of the workforce. The project itself worked both with individuals and groups. And what we could find from the work, the more ethnographic work, is the industry itself changed in response to threats. And it changed across the different sectors. So that condom use became the norm in the industry. It wasn't just dependent on the individuals who were working there. It became an industry norm, if you like. The networks of women, of managers, of maids, um, even of clients, they were the ones who actually made, um, made it the norm. What also was important from the qualitative work, and particularly when we followed women up for up to 10 to 15 years to find out what happened to them, was what was important in terms of their health. We had been very focused, I had, I won't say that we, I had been very focused on STIs, infection, sexual health, perhaps reproductive health. But when we followed up and tried to find out what were the main impacts on health of, the, of sex work, then we found that it was much more of a, there were many more problems in relation to mental health, addiction, and what would broadly be uh, perceived as health problems resulting from stigma. Now, stigma became a core area for our research in the sense that it wasn't the individual behaviours of the, the women themselves and, and what happened to them, but the stigma surrounding the profession that they felt had a huge impact on their health. And that affected the services that were seen as important. So whereas we might have started with, um, and I'm sure people in the audience, will, some will recognise these uh, they're probably still there, these. Um, this is the, <laughs> the clinical room where the Parade Street Project saw sex workers. So this, is the, this is the sort of thing we are talking, you know, we think, oh, what do sex workers need? Oh, they need to have checkups, they need B vaccines, they need the pill, whatever. This is people going out on outreach, um, and these are the kind of things. But actually, some of the services that have been developed around the Parade Street Project, this is, um, this is not the Parade Street Project, but this is a self-defense class of sex workers, what they wanted was other ways to help themselves stay safe and healthy, which was self-defense, because violence was a big problem. And this um, is an advert for, this is a banner heading, for an ongoing program of language classes for sex workers. Now, what's that got to help to do with health, you might say? Well, it's essential... If, you're going to, if you come into the country and you're doing sex work and you can't speak English, you can't negotiate safer sex, you need to have these skills. So bringing health into a much broader remit was also important. And another thing that I 
have learned. These are the images that fueled the initial idea, I think, that sex workers were going to be at risk and pose a risk to others. And these are based on epidemiological models that would suggest there is a core group that spreads and sustains disease in the wider population. And we have found no evidence of that in the UK. And this leads on to thinking about other potential ways of understanding how STIs are transmitted. If it's not core groups, or if it's not this core group, are there other core groups, or is it actually more complex? And there are changing patterns and networks of risk. And actually, having got into the sort of um, early 1990s and realized this wasn't um, an issue in terms of transmission of HIV and other STIs, um, then my research moved on to look at sexual networks and try and understand those in more detail, more finely, than you could by simply looking at one group compared to the rest. There was a great opportunity to do international work around this. And the, um, this picture at the top here is me on... I was at a conference in Amsterdam, so it was work. And I was standing outside... I have some other pictures which I didn't think I'd better put up. Might not be such a good role model. Um, anyway, um, so there's, uh, there's a lot of nice uh, cafes, aren't there, in that um, So this is me standing outside one of the sex shops. Um, what we did internationally, there was a, um, a horribly named organisation called Europap, um, which is the European something, project for AIDS prevention in prostitutes, terrible name. But anyway, we had a, a network trying to say, how do we, having done this research, and understanding a bit about what might prevent HIV and improve health, how do we actually make a difference? And so we developed guidelines for developing services, and we worked with lots of people, including lots of sex workers and lots of advocacy groups, um, to try and spread this good practice around Europe. And I think we were quite successful. Hustling for Health, um, this is, was translated into 12 languages, as far as I know, and I think is still available in printed form. I don't, it's not, the whole thing is not available on the internet, some bits of it are. So, to move away from sex work, just to say where I was at this stage, by the early 1990s, I had sort of transferred in, or, you know, moved sideways into public health from dental urinary medicine um, to pursue the research, and I was very lucky to get um, an MRC grant in 1988, which paid for me to continue my training and research. Um, and again, this is one of these things you look back and you think, this wouldn't happen now. I was a research registrar, very junior, with no real record of doing much research, and I was the PI on, a, on an MRC grant um, that, you know, employed four people for three years. I mean, it was, it, it's something that is very unlikely to happen now, but I was given the support to do that. Then, at the end of my training, so I found, I actually found that public health, unlike medicine that I'd found at medical school, public health exams were really, I sailed through them. Now, I don't know if that's because they're like, you know, GCSEs and A-levels, that they're just easier. <laughs> I don't think, I just think it's the kind of learning and so on that I was good at anyway. So I found it, that kind of gave me a boost of confidence. I found I didn't fail any of them and I got a distinction in my MSc and I thought, this is great, I can do this, I can do public health. So I did, I did my MSc. Um, and I completed my training in public health and spent some time at, um, in other places. Um, but then I came back to St. Mary's Medical School, which is this picture at the bottom, <laughs> and I got a senior lecturer post there in 1993, um, and I've been there ever since. My job title's changed, what well, I do change, but I've been there ever since. Um, and I did some work um, overseas, just short-term work looking at other elements in STI control. Now, so just to say how I think some of these themes are linking and to move away further from that. I think 
one of the key things I have learned and runs through my work is the importance of integrating different methods. So I said I went on to look at um, sexual networks. This, if you want to study sexual networks, if I wanted to do a sexual network study here, I'd have to interview all of you and ask you who you had sex with. And I'd have to then go and interview them. And I'd have to have lots of very confidential information that very few people would be willing to tell me. So it's a very difficult thing to do. You can start to do it through some of the partner notification methods, but it's really difficult to do empirical sexual network studies. So we decided it would be really good fun to use a biomarker, as I would now call it, um, a biological marker of those links, namely gonorrhea. So if someone's got gonorrhea and they give it to somebody else, that they'll have the same molecular type. And you'll be able to trace the transmission of that organism through the population. So you won't need to actually ask people. You'll just be able to see who's having sex with who by tracing this. It's all a bit of a fantasy, really. But there is the idea that you can, and it is true, you can actually use um, markers of the organism to track the transmission through a population, at least broadly speaking. And that's what we did uh, try to do. Again, this is working with um, Sophie Day, with Jonathan Weaver, and um, also with Kathy Eisen, um, who's not here today, um, who's at um, Centre for Infections now, um, and also with um, George Kinghorn and Jill Bell in Sheffield. Now, this study, so what we were trying to do is get people with gonorrhea and look at the, um, interview them, try and find out who had sex with who, get as much data as we could, and then also link it to the molecular type. Now, the genetic typing was not, uh, it wasn't the kind of fingerprinting we've got now, and therefore it wasn't as easy to do as it might be now. Um, but we were able to try and integrate. Now, the important thing here I'm saying about integration, if you've only got the biological information, then you make suppositions. You say... 40% of the population had one single type of gonorrhea and the rest had a variety of multiple types. Then we're assuming that those 40% are all linked to each other. But you can't be sure of that. You can't be sure how many transmissions it remains <coughs> stable unless you've got some corroborating evidence from actually talking to people and actually trying to track transmission. So although we tend to think that you you know, quantitative work is, and, give, and biological markers like this give you an answer. You always need to corrob corroborate them. And I think the integration of data that we tried to do in this study was powerful. And we did actually identify patterns and links that we wouldn't have seen if we just had one type of data alone. Now, lots of people don't like qualitative research. Lots of people at Imperial College don't like qualitative research. They think it's not proper, it's not science, it's not grown up. This quote is um, from a study of um, laboratory scientists, their attitudes to qualitative research. And this person said, there's always interpretation of the data. It's not like there's an absolute answer to every set of data. For instance, when we get bands of, on a gel, some kinds of numbers, it has to do with how you set up the machine, what you take as background, and how you control for external variables. All we can do is interpret things based on what we know already. There's nothing wrong with that. That's how science goes. Now, I think if you ask a lot of quantitative and biological scientists, they will agree. It's not... You actually do have to make decisions. There are qualitative decisions in saying this is a positive chlamydia test and this is a negative one. There's always a little bit in between that you're not quite sure and you make those decisions. And so there are those things. Now, in qualitative work, of course, people say it's all like that because it's all subjective. And I think that the challenge for us has to be that you have to be able to scientifically interpret, using social science, interpret the qualitative, to not just have it as anecdote, but to actually have it as something where you see patterns in both behaviours, 
and people's reported experiences. That's, I think, what we need to do. Now, moving rapidly on from sex work to modelling, it's uh, the, way you, the way your career takes off. It's usually actually the other way around, I think. <laughs> um, so, this is just um, a few papers. I'm not going to pretend that I can... Um, I'm not a modeler, I'm not a mathematical modeler, but everyone else in my department is, so I have to mention him. Um, not everybody, but it's um, the strength, great strength of our Department of Infectious Disease Epidemiology. But having worked on the gonorrhea study, part of that, in addition to what I've described, was mathematical modeling, which was done by Azra Ghani, who um, worked on this study as a researcher and did her PhD on that study. And she has worked on modelling, and um, I've worked with Peter White and Jeff Garnett as well. And so mathematical modelling is... I'll get shot down because there's a modellers here, won't I? But basically, it's, it's a sort of mathematical, complicated way of presenting thought experiments. If this, then this, then this, that will happen. But if this, then this, and that doesn't happen, then it won't. I know, that's a bit crude. But what you can do is... You can actually do some very elegant work by suggesting, and I'm going to look at this, the paper here, the vicious and virtuous circles, because I want to move on interventions. So you sort of come towards the end on interventions. Vicious and virtuous circles in the dynamics of infectious disease. This, is a, this was a period, this was in the mid 19 um, <coughs> No, this was in the early 2000s when we were looking at a situation where gonorrhea, having gone right down in the, after HIV, scared everybody and everybody stopped having sex. So nobody got gonorrhea, especially when we were doing our study. Couldn't find cases. It's really difficult to do the study. But then it started to increase quite rapidly. And people were worried that, you know, why is this um, gonorrhea taking off again? And one of the theories was that actually because people couldn't get into clinics. The Prairie Street Clinic I described at the beginning, where people could queue up for six hours and get seen. They didn't like queuing up for six hours, but they got seen. Ten years later, they'd be waiting six weeks. Not for the Jeffreys Wing Clinic, I might say. That was, you could still queue six hours. But most clinics in the country set up a system whereby you made an appointment and you queued for the weeks rather than hours, which may have been a better patient experience but it was not necessarily very good for the control of infections because people, strangely enough, continue to have sex when they have symptoms of an STI while they're waiting for an appointment. So this was, the paper was a model basically looking at if we increase capacity in clinics, could we reduce gonorrhea? And I won't go through the details of the maths because I don't know it. I do remember looking at it at the time and thinking it looked okay for that. I was involved. My role in that is to, you know, what are the assumptions? What actually happens in real life? And then somebody does the clever mathematical bits in the middle. Um, so this was what would happen, for example, if you increased clinic capacity by 10%. This is what would happen to the incidence of gonorrhea. If you increased capacity by 20%, this is what would happen, etc. So if you increase clinic capacity by 50%, you get a fairly rapid decrease in the incidence of gonorrhea. And there was a further part of this paper that suggested you could do that temporarily and then reduce it again. So you could have it as a, you know, a mass campaign, reduce waiting times in GU medicine, control gonorrhea. And, interestingly, it actually happened. It had impact, that, that one paper here, which actually has been very rarely cited, disappointingly, but has probably had more impact than um, many other papers that I've certainly been involved in. Because what happened was, it was part of the body of evidence that was taken to the Department of Health and informed the campaign to have 48-hour um, waiting times as the maximum in GU clinics, and that actually became a target. I know everyone hates target, but it became a target, and it made a difference, and gonorrhea went down. I can't say what caused it, but it certainly contributed to better sexual health services. So if you're going to have an impact on public health, 
you need to understand the determinants through etiological research, so finding out what causes things, having frameworks for understanding what's important in this. There's always causal pathways, so you need to understand those frameworks. You need to evaluate interventions, and that hopefully will then inform policy. So that's what I call getting stuck in, getting research and putting it into practice. So I've been involved in the, um, I was on the independent advisory group of sexual health. I've been involved in BASH, which is a professional association um, of GU uh, physicians. ECDC, the European Centers for Disease Control. I worked for a time at the Health Protection Agency. Um, and this is just to show, for example, these are the purport, this was following, the pa that paper came out in 19, in 2005, so you'll see this is the proportion of people seen within 48 hours or offered an appointment within 48 hours virtually doubled in the years following when there was a campaign to actually improve services. So I think that's having an impact. I also worked on outbreaks when I was at the HPI. I was there on a part-time secondment. And that led to a whole other area of work where, again, I've tried to combine methods, molecular understanding of this, the granulomas type of chlamydia, and there was an outbreak of this, combining methods of qualitative research, quantitative research, and molecular methods. Now, I wanted to move on to finish off by saying that it's not just about research being an academic. And some of the lessons that I've learned from research, though, have, applied, have, have been very useful for me in teaching. And one of the things that I, I suppose I haven't talked about very much about is that in that research with sex workers, and ongoing with the research on LGB, for example, it's been working with the users of the services or the participants in the research, working very closely with them to frame, to shape services or to shape the research itself. So in education, of course, you don't do that. We know what, usually teaching, you know, we know what you lot need to know. We're the teachers. You need to know what we tell you. Well, I think that's not the way it works anymore. And the global health issue that Jenny mentioned has been a good example of this. I'm, I haven't done a huge amount of research overseas or anything, um, unlike Alan Fennick, who's shown at the top here, teaching on this course. Um, but I was one of the people approached when the students themselves said they wanted more global health in the curriculum. And I was very receptive, I am very receptive to that kind of approach from students. And then we worked very closely, Alan Fennick and myself initially, worked very closely with students to design a course, deliver a course, and this was a short course. The students came to us and said they wanted a one-month summer school. And you're like, get a life, for goodness <laughs> sake. You know, am I really going to spend my August? No. Why? I mean, I didn't want to work up evenings and weekends. I'm damn sure I don't want to work all of August every year. So we compromised on a one-week course, but we designed it with the students. We launched it um, four years ago now. And it was hugely successful. It was the most enjoyable teaching I've ever done. We've got fantastic speakers, fantastic students, and we've been sold out every year. And it only costs 40 quid, so watch out for it on the website. It's an excellent course. But then that led to working with the students to get more global health in the wider curriculum, and then led to BSc. So this is the first cohort of graduates from the, uh, the BSc that finished um, earlier this year. It's not all of them. Um, but it, that, again, I hope, is turning into a successful and popular course. We get people from external intercalating students. And so, again, that's talking about raising these issues. First of all, participation of the students in the teaching, which I, it's always good to get someone else to do your work for you, isn't it? Um, so there's participation and participatory work, multiple methods, and trying to educate in some way to educate students about the fact you need to know about lots of different methods if you are going to make decisions on global health and be a global health practitioner. Um, if you're talking about global health, now global health is one of the mottos of it is, is think globally and act locally. And that is, global health to me is not health in foreign countries. It is health in the world and 
London is part of the world. London is a very global city. It's got lots of people, lots of migrants, lots of very mixed communities. But it's also about the inequalities in health across the world. And if epidemiology teaches you to understand the determinants, the importance of persistent, consistent finding that poverty, social class, ethnicity, gender, all of those really affect people's health outcomes. If you're going to be, pretend to be a public health person and a global health activist, then you really need to do something locally. So if the Braid Street Project is something that I'm very proud of having been part of setting up for sex workers, I would like to think that there are other things that we can do for other parts of the population. I don't, I don't want to just prioritise sex workers over everybody else. That seems unfair. So the Academic Health Science Centre creation, um, I think, gave an opportunity to say, well, is it possible that we can actually do some more positive, proactive public health interventions. And an interventional public health part of the trust, Imperial College Healthcare Trust, was established three years ago. And I think that is a hugely exciting possibility. And one of the things I've been doing in that has been, I've been leading on health promotion within that. So we've become a health promoting hospital, which just means we send a lot of money to the WHO and we fill in a form. But that actually has given us an impetus for getting people together from across the trust to say, what health promotion are we doing? And how can we improve actually positive health interventions? Um, so health promoting hospitals means not just promoting health in a positive way, treating illness, yes, using the opportunity to promote better health um, for patients, but also for staff for the local community and to improve the local environment. That's the remit. So uh, it's quite a big remit that we've got under that. But we are doing work around smoking cessation, the more simpler ends of it. Smoking cessation, dietary advice, etc., etc. Um, but the other thing about interventional public health is that we do a lot of work in the School of Public Health on etiological epidemiology. For example, um, we're involved in setting up these large-scale biobanks, which will study some of both the genetic and the um, metabolic determinants of people's diseases, but also their outcomes of treatment, in order to inform more what's now called stratified medicine, what kind of treatment will be effective for particular types of people, which is very exciting and huge growing area. But I, going back to some of the things I talked about earlier, if our research is to be beneficial for the population that we serve, I think it does need to be inclusive. So one of the areas of research that I'm working on at the moment, or we're carrying out, is understanding why people participate in research, whether it's something that is beneficial to them, and how we can make it more inclusive. So that our research is really of benefit to the whole local population. Then the final area, I suppose, is improving patient experience. Now, this may seem a bit off from public health. Patient experience has become a really hot topic. Well, there's a thing, you know, today from the Patients Association about yet more evidence that there's a lack of care in many hospitals and organisations. Nurses no longer care. It's, uh, keep getting these reports. And I do think that this is... An important, it's not a surprise that some of these things are happening. Hospitals have become places for treatment, not for care. And this is something, it's very pertinent to me. I had this heart problem when I was a child, and then it's, I thought I was cured. I'm, a very, I'm basically a very biomedical sort of person. I had a hole in my heart, it was cured, that's fine, I don't have it anymore. Then, four years ago, I realised actually oh, I was diagnosed that it had recurred and I needed further treatment. And I've had quite a lot of, some of you know, interesting experiences of um, the health system after that, like nearly dying um, when they did a minimally invasive procedure on me. You know, these things happen. And I'm here again to tell the story. But I've also had a lot of experience of being in hospitals. And unlike 40 years ago, now... You're only in hospital if you're really, really ill. I mean, the moment you can walk, you're kicked out. Um, so 
what it means is that the, there's a huge amount of effort from all the staff on the treatment, the management, the admission and discharge make up about 90% of the whole time you're there. The procedures of being clerked and being discharged. You know, you're lucky you've got time for the procedure you came in for in the middle. So that the caring things do tend to be neglected and they are not as valued. Nurses and the increasing professional role of the nurse, which has great strengths at one level, I think there's a, a gap opening up where a lot of the caring is left to healthcare assistants who are not trained. And we had a lecture from Jane Bruton, who's here today as well, in the sociology course for medical students of covering some of these issues. So a lot of changes. And that lack of thinking that caring is important means that the patient experience can actually be, you know, you may get better. And this is a, one of the sort of things about Imperial. You know, it's great, you know, they don't kill you. You've got the best, the, you know, you've got the best SMRs, the lowest mortality in the country, but the worst experience may not, well, for some things, yes. Bad experience, good outcomes. And I think we need to start thinking how can we align those two together, that we can get those brilliant outcomes, but we can also improve the experience that patients have and show that there is caring there. There are many initiatives going on about that, and I'm not going to go through them. This is just to remind me to say my living the patient experience. This little umbrella, I've got two of those in my heart. It's called an Amplatzer device. Um, and that's how they now fix holes in the heart with these little things. So if you have one of those done, just make sure they don't give you a retroperitoneal bleed while they're trying to get it in there. <laughs> the other thing I wanted to say is that, again, it goes back to quantitative, qualitative. This, on this slide here, this is the kind of device where if, you, if you're lucky and you're in hospital, they'll ask you to fill this out and say, you know, did you have a nice time? Did they fix your tires? You know promptly or whatever. So, you know, we collect this data on hundreds of thousands of records we've got now on what patients say about their experience. So you're tick effectively you're ticking boxes. But that doesn't really tell you what happened. And so again, we've set, we've set up a Centre for Patient Experience Research, the idea of using multiple methods to try and really understand how patients experience that whether or not we can actually improve it, and how people, different types of people experience care and treatment, and how we can try and deliver better services for the whole population, which I would hope would then lead to implementing and evaluating improvement programs. The kind of research I've talked about of um, mixed, what might call mixed methods, there's been a critique that it's is it just mixed up? Am I really a jill of all trades and mistress of none? And I think the challenge, which is a real challenge, is that you use multiple methods, as this quote says, to, um, to provide an account that's dialectical. It uses different insights from these methods to tell you something new, something greater than the sum of those methods independently. And that's what I would hope a strong qualitative and quantitative methodology, social and biological methodologies linked together, can do and, and should do. Now, there's lots of people here I'd like to thank who have contributed to my career, um, and there's many, many others, some of whom are sitting in here who don't have, who have very, ma very cleverly managed to not have their photos on Google. <laughs> Um, and I just wanted to, to mention a couple. Um, Sophie Day, I've already mentioned, who we've worked um, closely together for so long that, um, you know, I don't think it's... People always used to get us mixed up. It was always Sophie Ward and Helen Day, you know, because they couldn't really tell us apart, even though we had such different disciplinary backgrounds. Um, Kathy Eisen, who isn't here today, couldn't be here, but has been a great influence. As a, um, She's also an honorary professor, visiting professor in our department. And um, Willie Harris, who actually gave me the opportunity, first of all, to pursue research in the clinic. Um, Sheila Adam, who Sheila was regional director of public health when I was starting all this. And 
she believed in me. She kept giving me money, which was very helpful at that stage of my career. And she funded the porter cabin, which we needed to set up our, our service. And um, there's many other people here who um, some of you will recognise, or some of you will recognise some of them. But for reasons of time, I'm not going to go through them all. And finally, most important of all, this is my husband and my children. My children are a lot bigger than this now, but I wanted to use this photo because... Nothing so good has happened since. This was night Liverpool won the Champions League. <laughs> <laughs> we were, and we also happened to be on holiday, and it was a great night. And I just want to thank Ben for putting up with me, because even though I started off by saying I wanted a career where I could do all sorts of other things and just work nine to five and not work weekends, it hasn't quite worked out like that. So thank you for your patience, and uh, also thank you to the rest of you for listening.